Okay, so welcome. And uh, so today is the first day of um, the list techniques program that will be uh, will be publicly available on YouTube. Um, so for those who um, obviously for those who are live, you have some uh, knowledge of what this program is about. Um, but I think it'll be helpful for you as well just to kind of review that. And uh, certainly for anybody who's watching this on YouTube, um, probably would like to have some idea of what this program is about and you know what what it how to plug into it. So the um, the idea here is, and I've just uh, written uh, and published something on my blog um, that I'll link to when I uh, I'll, I'll send it out to everybody in the in the messenger group here, who's here live, and then for those who are on, uh, watching it on YouTube, I'll put a, a link in the description to it if I remember. Um, but it's my first attempt at a rough outline of I'm understanding the bigger picture of what it is that I'm intending to communicate about. And um, I'll just summarize it for you briefly. And this won't be news to anybody who's here live because you've heard me speak about this before, but um, that broadly speaking, we can understand that the problems that we have, when we perceive that we have problems of various sorts, um, and that those problems are uh, due to ignorance. You know, we can understand it in a variety of ways. For, for, for example, you could understand that um, if you have a problem at a just a, at a mundane level, at our ordinary level of consciousness, um, that if you have the problem, it's because you don't know what the solution is. You're ignorant of the solution. So it applies there, but it also applies in a more meaningful and useful sense to understand that we're ignorant of what the nature of the problem is in the first place. You know, we don't actually understand what this actually is. And so most people are stuck at a lower level of consciousness. And uh, in, the, in this essay, I elaborate on this, but briefly, um, the Sanskrit terms are ajata, which means uncreated, um, then, then there's uh, drishti shrishti, which you know, that's a hard one to say, but that means that the the perception is the creation, that the perception precedes the creation, so that the creation is a projection of the perception. Uh, and then there's uh, shrishti drishti, which means that the creation precedes the perception so that the creation the material objective reality it, it has an independent existence and that i perceive it only because it has that independent existence well that last one is the mode from which that's normal human consciousness average human consciousness on the world as it is today and on this planet today most people are operating from that level of consciousness the collective of humanity is functioning um, at that level. And so because the collective is functioning at that level, the that then we tend to, if we're not otherwise able to have uh, clarity, we tend to fall to that level because it's the default. It's what everybody's doing. Well, uh, it's well, so first of all, it's pretty rare, although these days not, not as rare as it might have been in at sometimes in the past, but still somewhat rare for a, for a person to really uh, be given clearly the message that that materialist mode of perception is uh, not the only truth, maybe not even the truth, maybe not even a truth, and certainly not that uh useful if your actual desire is, um, let's just say, to feel better. The reason why is because when you're stuck at that level, you're always in, you're always expending more energy than you're getting back. You can observe that very simply. Like, for example, they say it takes more calories to eat a stick of celery than, it does, than you get from the stick of celery. <laughs> You know, you're told to eat all your green vegetables, but and I'm not saying don't eat your green vegetables, but in terms of just energy, 
you use more energy to eat them than you do than you extract from them. Ruminants are different. They have a different digestive system. <laughs> they have many more bacteria that can do something with all of that. Uh, but you know, you, you, you and I, in general, that's a, a net energy loss. And in a similar way, you can see in your life, much of the time, you're stuck at that level of consciousness in which you perceive, I'm this person, and there's that world out there, and I'm perceiving the world because it really is out there. And boy, that world is causing me all these problems. You know, that person over there is doing that thing to me, and that government is doing that thing, and that organization. And, you know, and you objectify your own body, and, you know, so your body is doing things to you. And um, so at that level, you see how people are functioning and you look, look to your own life and you see that um, it, it involves an enormous amount of energy expenditure because it's, it's gotten to a point where it's very dense. So we want to start to understand, it's helpful, I'm proposing, to start to understand that uh, actually the this creation that we perceive is densely objectively really out there is uh, not really, that that's not really the most useful way to perceive it, that, that that's just our habit. But we can step back and we can see this, this other, from this other difficult to say perspective, which is the drishti shrishti, which means that we can start to see, well, wait a second now, uh, all, all of this that I think is out there, all these things that I think are causing me problems, how do I know that that's actually causing me a problem? In other words, what is the real problem? Because my thoughts tell me, well, it's all about all those things. You know, if only that person would get their act together, and if only that government would stop being, you know, evil and crazy, and yada, yada, yada. And if only my body would magically reverse in age and go back to youthful whatever, then, you know, magical thinking, I, then it would all, then I would be okay. But we can see that that doesn't work. All that does is I'm doing a lot of stuff and I'm not getting a lot of benefit. So, because you, know, you look, you know, God bless them all. I, I guess maybe it's necessary, although I'm actually proposing not. But, you know, you look at all the activists, all the people and all the politicians and all the organizations that are seeking to produce change. And you, you cynically know that uh, I hope you, I probably, you know, like all those, you know, non, non, non government organizations, the NGOs and, the, you know, all, the, notoriously the vast, almost all, all of the money and energy goes into just maintaining the the vehicle the bureaucracy and so little actually trickles down to what it's meant to change so and you know all these stories of corruption and everything so that's i'm just proposing that's not efficient that's not the best way already you know the wrong people hearing this are going to already start being angry with me because they, they're, they're going to misunderstand it and think that I'm saying that we should just be all selfish, that we shouldn't care for others. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when we go about it in the wrong way, we get the wrong results for everybody, including ourselves. So we want to start to see, well, look, there's a, maybe a different way. So rarely, we somebody comes along and gives this message and it's heard that, Hey, look, notice that all of this stuff that you think is the problem, uh, just for a moment, forget about all of that and notice how do you know that there's a problem? So you can just notice that for yourself right now. You can imagine some situation, some person, place, thing, whatever, that you think that you habitually perceive is a problem. Whatever that is, that problem person, that problem animal, that problem organization, that problem weather, the problem whatever, whatever it is, you imagine that, the problem memory. And then you notice that at least to some extent, all you have to do is think about it. 
and there it is. Now, could it really be the thing? Or might it be, you just take a look and see, actually, it's just this reaction that I find so unbearable. You know, that's, I just, whatever it is, it's the anger, the fear, the um, whatever that is, that you say, ah, th that's the problem. And that's, now that's, you're starting to get clear when you can see that. And this is really helpful to you. And uh, in many ways, not the least of which is finally, uh, when you can, the, the, when you are able to perceive in this way, you're not losing energy. Now, you may not be necessarily improving your situation, but although you might be, but you're definitely not losing in a bad way. You could lose in a good way, but here I'm saying losing in a bad way. You're definitely not falling into worse, worse energy deficit and despair and misery and hopelessness when you can see that actually all of the problem and the only problem is my perception, my experience. Well, so now this doesn't completely solve the problem because uh, you know you can still see that you, there still seems to be a problem, but it's just that you are able to recognize that the problem is subjective, it's not objective. So you want to see how that how you can recognize that. Well, now, eventually, I'm proposing, the more that you can stay with that. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. I know I'm not completing that sentence. But don't misunderstand and think that I'm, I'm saying that uh, you should, you should uh, you know, start reading every book you can on the law of attraction. Because that sounds very much like this uh, drishti shristi business. It's sort of true. But the law of attraction is off, which is just, a, it's just the law of attraction really is just a, a name for a, what we could say is a natural law. It's just that like attracts like. Um, but which is just saying the same thing, which is that what you, that this creation is none other than your perception. So whatever you actually believe, whatever that that gives uh, shape to your belief, and that is the th that is or that gives shape to your perception, which is the creation, that which you experience. Now, I'm not here. I'm not necessarily saying you, you don't need to accept or deny uh, th that there is any creation. You can. It's fine. You can say there is a, an objective creation, or you can say the creation is only a dream. It doesn't matter. Either way, all we're saying is that from this perception, you can recognize, at least to some degree, that all that you have access to, all that you know, is that perception. So that your entire your entire creation, your entire reality, all that you know is only that. There's only that perception. So um Hopefully you can see that's much more efficient because you're no longer, and that's why I say you're at least no longer going to be falling into uh, this worsening uh, whirlpool of misery. Because at, at least here you can recognize, oh, it's just the subjective that I need to give my attention to. I don't need to be so concerned about strategizing about how I'm going to do all these things, how I'm going to get my revenge and how I'm going to protect myself and how I'm going to get for me and mine, and how I'm going to achieve all these things. Instead, I can just look and see, oh, I, I'm just feeling insecure. I'm just feeling, uh, uh, you know, uncomfortable. I'm feeling afraid. So you stay with the subjective and it's much much more direct. Well, I, and I'm proposing the more you stay with that, then that naturally, eventually uh, blends into this ajata, which is that 
there's nothing's created, that there's um, only the self. Not the self like myself, like my individual self, but the self in the sense that the so the, the different terms that are used traditionally depends on the school of philosophy, but um, one example is Atman and Brahman. So Atman is understood as the, the, the individual soul. So you could say, that's the truth of who you are, okay, is the Atman. Um, it's... Now, this Atman is, we look and see, well, what is the nature of this Atman? So you, as you're observing your experience, your subjective experience, the thing that you perceive is, is, is the problem um, at a subjective level, not at an objective level, then you start, what you're really starting to do is notice that, well, all of, the, all of this subjective stuff, it's it actually really kind of comes down to the subject you know it's like it all it all has to do with me it's my feelings my thoughts my memories my perception it's all has to do with me it's that's if, if if there was no me there then there couldn't be a problem so um because because of that subjective level still if you're trying if you're trying to uh to fix it all at that level, trying to you know manage all of the feelings and all of the, you know, rearrange all the thoughts and all the memories, it's maybe doable. Um, and well, in fact, I would say it is doable. Um, but and and maybe maybe that's even desirable. I'm 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 not going to say that it couldn't be, or that it would be bad. Uh, I'm. It's not necessary, but. It, but it, it could be fine, um, could be problematic, but it could be fine. Um, but the, but even if that's your desire, in other words, if even if your desire is to have a, to 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 manifest the bliss of your true nature, uh, you know, into this creation, so that it is a reflection of that bliss, that it is beautiful and pleasing uh then you definitely want to do it in an in, in the most efficient way possible because if you're doing it in an inefficient way you might end up falling back into suffering because it could happen you know it's like a, it, it can be a slippery slope you can have you know fantastic revelations and realizations and discoveries and insights and relative sense of freedom and um, and a sense of you know progressive goodness and that's all fine and good but if you don't if you don't finally establish yourself clearly in the um, in the true source, then you could fall so deeply asleep again that you forget. So the um, this is just to provide a, a framework of understanding so that we can just talk, maybe talk about it uh, and understand what's being said. So here uh, we we need to be able to. Oh, this is this is what I want. How I want to um, make sense of all this is that we need to understand where we are presently i often say it's an important principle that you, you you can only start where you are oftentimes we try to start somewhere else because we think that somewhere else will be better say well that's a better place so i should start there but you're not there so you can't start there so all you do is you just keep fantasizing about it but it doesn't happen because it's nothing other than a fantasy that we have to start to see that that again when we really understand this model that I've just presented of Ajata, uh, I have to think through it all the time, uh, Drishti Shristi, and then Shristi Drishti, that, that there's a, um, it, it's a helpful model if we understand it correctly, because we can identify where am I in consciousness right now? Now, obviously, if you're perceiving from Ajata, 
there's no problem. There's no in, there's no separate self. There's no possibility of a problem. There's only sat chit ananda, which is being consciousness of bliss. Okay, so um, congratulations. Wonderful. What a blessing to all of us. Sincerely. Um, but if that's not the case, then you you need to un understand what the um, you know, where where you are in in terms of th these other uh, states of or modes of perception. Because if you because because you're going to help yourself best when you can at least shift to uh, the perception of 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 drishti shristi, meaning that you recognize that the perception is the creation, or the perception precedes the creation, because it's more efficient. If you're if you're stuck at this denser level of perceiving, again, you're always going to be expending more energy than you're getting back. You can just please look at your life and see the truth of that. I I mean, I hope that it's really important that you can please don't just take anything that I say and think, oh, that, oh, you know, that must be true. I'll just write that down as, as like a thing, but it has to be actually reflected upon so that you can see the truth of it for yourself, not as dogma, but as, a, as, as, as something that you can truthfully recognize in your own experience. So you want to see, yeah, like take a look every time it every time i'm caught up in reacting from the anxiety from the anger from the fear from the worry from all this from the depression i'm already in a bad position i'm already on the defensive i'm already losing energy i'm already frantic i'm already in a bad place and it's it doesn't get better from there not as long as i continue that the more i continue that though in fact the worse it gets and i hope that, i hope that you can see the truth of that it's really, really i think it's really important because that should be a big motivator for you to take at that point when you recognize that that is happening that sh you should you should be you should be uh shaken hopefully gently but nonetheless awake so that you can say oh wow this hurts and there's a better way and i know some things that will help me and that's what the bliss techniques are are the things that can help you so just to review there um because what the te the bliss techniques do i oh i want to bring this back in is they give us a, um, a, a method by which we can repeatedly uh, taste the higher states of consciousness, okay? So that we can shift from that denser state of materialism and perceiving that I'm the separate person who has to do things in these very dense ways because everything is limited and the only way that I can attain what I really want is to do all of these really painful, awkward, strange things. You have to start to see how you think most people, okay, notice how this is true. Most people, they want happiness. Don't they? Most people want happiness. Now, happiness is, is, is what? It's subjective. And it's actually available to you like that. But how do most people go about trying to attain happiness? In all the wrong ways. <laughs> In all the ways that lead to pain. They think, well, I could be happy, you know, if I made more money. And so, because if I had more money, then I could buy more stuff. And if I could buy more stuff, then I'd maybe be more comfortable. And if I was more comfortable, surely I'd be more happy. And so they think, well, I guess I, if I need, I, I need more money, clearly. And uh, I mean, that's obvious, right? You know, most people are like, it's obvious. I need more money. 
Who doesn't think it's obvious that they need more money? 99% of the world thinks it's obvious they need more money, when in fact, nobody needs any money. Nobody. No possibility of anybody ever needing money. It's conceive of that. It's absolutely absurd because it's false. It doesn't, it's a, it's a fantasy. It's an abstraction. But most people think they need the money when in fact, what they're actually wanting is happiness. And that they can access directly, but they don't know it. So we need to be able to shift our, our state of consciousness, our, our mode of perception. It's essential because as long as we stay stuck at the lower level, as I've pointed out repeatedly, we're being depleted. We're losing energy. It's a, it's a poor management of energy. Just briefly to make this clear, understand that, and this has been said, I'm not making this up myself. This is stuff that's been pointed out by many teachers throughout history, uh, the, you know, like notably uh, the Buddha. It's like, look, if you look at see and see what's the problem, you'll see it's the attachment or they'll say it's the desire. I think it's clearer to say the attachment, though, because the desire in and of itself is not a problem. So and I, I, I described this in the essay briefly, but there's a notion in Indian thought that's called karma. You might know about karma. Karma just means action. So action begets action. That's the theory of karma. And that's the law of karma, is that every action be, begets another action. And so every action begins, it has its beginning with another action in the past. Now, you have to see, obviously, from the Ajata perspective, which is that nothing has ever happened, which is available to you right now, you just flash on it. I make this point in the essay too. It's not hard. You just let everything go for an instant. You flash on it. But you don't have to sustain it forever, just for an instant, so you can recognize that it's true. It's real. Yes, really. There, nothing, nothing in this one instant, in this very instant right now, there's only, only uh, that which can't be described. That, that which can't be named. So, uh, now where was I going? I got sidetracked there. The, the um, yes, so the, the, the arc though, is we want to see that there's, a, there's this karma, which is just a theory. It's just at, a, at a, another lower level, not the supreme level of understanding, but it's useful as a model. We can see, okay, this action begets this action, begets this action, begets this action. So as long as I'm attached to it, I'm attaching myself to that endless chain of happenings. You see, if I'm attached to it, if I'm attached to it, I'm attaching myself to it. I'm saying this is me and mine and I have to figure it out and I have to solve it and I've got to get it all right. Then we've attached ourselves not to just that one thing, but to the entirety of what that one thing really is it's spread out through all eternity it's it, it, it is endless one thing follows another thing follows another thing which is why i'm saying at that dense level you you are attaching yourself to that and you'll just get dragged along you know papaji would describe it he'd say it's like you're standing along this road and the car comes along and you grab on to the uh, onto the fender and it drags you along until you can't hold on any longer and then you fall off and you roll off to the side of the road and you finally you can dust yourself off and you stand there on the side of the road and another car comes along and it repeats so this is what we're doing to ourselves all, all the time and um and so but they say okay this is just the nature of how this creation operates at that level and we start to think, oh, no, despairingly, you know, like, this is just going to, so you're just saying it's all suffering? No, it's not all suffering. They say, oh, the, and then the response is, oh, great, it's not all suffering. So you mean that it's just going to all end? No, it's not all going to end. I say, but how could that be? Then, then it's all suffering. I say, no, it's the attachment. Because see, we're so fixated on the material, we think, 
This is what matters. I've got to change all of this. If only all this would change. If only, you know, the, all this stuff would be different. Then I could be okay. But it's the attachment to it. Because the attachment is what gives it its shape. It's what locks your perception into that way of seeing. So that that's what you're experiencing. But now, the point I wanted to make with this, though, is that in regard to karma, they, they differentiate, and I'm no expert on this, but they differentiate between all the different kinds of types of karma. I mean, they, the, they, they have some very, very sophisticated and um, complete understandings of, of these things. It's really, really phenomenal. Um, so I don't have all of that understanding, but they, they have this notion of what's called parabda. It's another one of those funny words, hard to say, parabda um, karma. So it's a type of karma. And it's, if, as, as I understand it, it's the karma that specifically from the past is producing this, this present experience. So we say that you have certain latent tendencies. You have certain conditioning. You can just that that uh, has a tendency to color things in a certain way. You haven't you noticed that, like, something happens and your first your first reaction to it, it's so predictable, isn't it? You know, it's like you leap to that conclusion, and if you just pause and step back and look at it and wait and see from a bigger perspective, you'll realize that that was a a false conclusion to draw, but you leap right into it and you think that's the, the the reality you know it's like that person looks over in this way and in this direction and you just think what what are they judging me for how dare they and you're getting all upset you know you have ever had that experience maybe it's just me but something to that of that sort you know it doesn't have to be that you're upset that they're judging but whatever you you interpret the glance in a particular way. You leap into it and you just immediately assume that's true. It's so obvious to you. Like it's the only possible meaning. You're, you're certain. Couldn't be anything else. But when you, with some space and perspective, you realize, oh, especially if you can get clear, you, you, can, you talk to them about it and they say, oh, no, I I wasn't even looking at you. I, there was a, you know, there was a, 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 a bird flew over in that direction and I was, it was such a beautiful color. I was just looking at it and it was off in the distance. So I was squinting a little bit. So the, here's, here's the thing is, is this, this tendency, this parabda has a, a tendency to color things. So, it's it's just a tendency for something to for us to leap to that conclusion to that conclusion that particular one instead of any of the others you know like why do you jump to that conclusion instead of assuming this is the you know this is the purposeful expression of god's grace you know like think about that if that was the if that was the thing you leapt to every time wouldn't your life be different if every single thing that happens is if for you is just wow, this is the purposeful expression of God's grace, then you you wouldn't have any problems. So it's the the tendency though is may not be so useful. And in fact, oftentimes is not because if 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 it's a if it's a helpful parabda. See, not all karma is bad. The like the idea that it's good or bad is just our evaluation but it's just is it's, it's just a neutral uh uh natural law it's not a, a like a moral judgment on you uh it's just simply the nature of how it works so um but some of it you could perceive as positive some of it you could perceive as negative right and oftentimes we tend to focus on what we think is the negative but you could equally have positive karma, right? And that's the idea oftentimes is there are various ways to 
uh, cultivate positive karma. And we think about they like, oh, that's so, you know, silly. No, they're just observing natural law and they're saying, look, if you can sincerely uh, cultivate these modes of perceiving th th so that you start to leap to these conclusions instead of those other ones that are unhelpful, then you'll start to naturally, effortlessly perceive things in a positive way. Like you could actually condition yourself so that you do start to perceive that everything that's happening is the purposeful expression of God's grace. Why not? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, that's that's the idea here with bliss techniques, which I know, you know, we're like way in and everybody's like, oh, come on, give me, give me, give me. Okay, so we'll try, I'll try to wrap it up, but I want to give you the context to understand that the purpose of the technique is to help you to shift your state of consciousness and your, your mode of perception to that which is more helpful and aligned with what is really true for you. In other words, the truth of who you are. Now, when I say something like the truth of who you are, then immediately we say, oh, it must be something. Who is, who is, what is that? That mysterious true self, what could that be? And we, you know, we can't help ourselves. We start to imagine something. It's either, you know, there it is, it's, you know, you know, blue Shiva with the, you know, cobras wrapped around him and whatever. It's, the, it's you know, the, you know, the old bearded guy in the sky, bearded man in the sky, or the, you know, it's Mother Mary, or it's the, you know, some like great ghost or whatever. We've got some notion of it, but it's, 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 most most accurately, it's none of those things, and it's most it's best recognized simply by letting go. For instance, just letting go of all the grasping, letting go of all of the clinging, letting go of all the striving, letting go of all of that, all of the efforting, just for an instant, like that. And that that's the best thing. But. Uh, Oftentimes we don't know how to do that. We or we we do it, but then we don't know how to translate that into something helpful for us. And so what we need, and I'm propo I'm proposing what we need, or what will be helpful to us is to have these techniques by which we can reliably shift our perception, our state of consciousness, and we can start to actually have more reliable access to um, both the, I would say, the supreme reality of the self in its formless nature and um, increasing uh, uh, awareness of the actual structure, I could say, of, of our experience so that to the degree that we choose to perceive creation, which we all do, we have the um, knowledge and the means by which we can uh, be a blessing to that creation. You know, that, that that's our, that's really, I would say, in a sense, like that's our real desire. It's like this creation is here in a sense because we love it. Uh, and, but we don't know how to love it. We love it, but we're afraid. We're, we love it, but we, you know, we, we're apprehensive because we're concerned that we might get hurt or lost or something of that sort. So these techniques help in a sense to uh, lift us and to shift us so that we can access the bliss, which which is our true nature, so that we can more and more turn in that way and start to recognize that there's an alternative to the to that habit of sinking into the despair 
Instead, we can allow ourselves to be drawn into the bliss of our true nature. So in order to do that, now there are many techniques. And so um, my aim is to share with you some of the or the techniques that I'm aware of that I have familiarity with that are um, that I am, let's say, authorized or can you know have the have the authority um, born from the actual direct experience and knowledge of it to be able to provide some instruction in that will most effectively and reliably help you in this way. So the techniques can be widely varied, uh, but here, at least to start, we're focused on, we're going to focus primarily on pranayama um, in the in the Iyengar tradition, but it's not, I'm not an I, a certified Iyengar practitioner, so I can't you know, give you that kind of certified instruction. <laughs> but um, so it's through my experience, but it's inspired by the Iyengar tradition uh, of pranayama, specifically through his book, Light on Pranayama, which is an excellent book. Um, although for the uninitiated, uh, it probably is too dense, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's it's worth getting but if you if you find feel if you find your eyes glossing over because you can't understand it or something like that then maybe just set it aside for now and come back to it at a later time uh or just skim through it and find the things that stand out for you but um it is it is an excellent book so we're going to focus on um some instruction on um on uh, Ujjayi Pranayama. And so for those who are here live, we've been doing this for the last couple of weeks, so you're familiar with it, um, but we're gonna do a guided, um, I'm gonna give you guided, uh, we'll do a guided practice. And um, this will be clarifying for you on um, how to get the, uh, maximum benefits of the, utilizing the technique so that you can um, be most efficient with it because otherwise what happens is we can we can practice for a very long time um, which i can attest to because i've um i've done an enormous amount of practice uh i mean tens of thousands of hours uh and much of it in a bad way. And so you get what you practice, you perfect. And if you're doing it in a bad way, you'll perfect doing it in a bad way. And uh, so it's so getting the right instruction is really, really important. And then following that instruction. So apparently we're going to be accompanied by whistles. I don't know if you can hear that, but. Pranayama accompanied by whistles. So um, to fully appreciate the whistles, you're going to want to lie down on your back, if that's possible for you. Um, if it's not possible for you, then you may uh, explore this from any posture that's comfortable for you. And certainly, uh, Ujjayi does not have to be exclusively practiced uh, lying on the back, but Iyengar gives this progression starting on the back, and I find that it is uh, really an excellent progression. So I I highly recommend it um, if it's possible for you. So you're gonna, if possible, you're gonna lie on the back, um, in a in a place that you feel comfortable and supported, but ideally not, if possible, not on something so cushiony that you sink into it, um, because it will tend to um, cradle the body rather than keeping the body in a, in a more firmly supported position. But if you need to do it lying on bed, that's okay. But if, if you can do it lying on a, a firmer surface um, and do that comfortably, that would be better. 
So right from the beginning, you want to um, allow yourself to really be supported and relax. So you uh, have many possibilities, many variations available to you, and you could invent your own. Uh, Iyengar gives some suggestions, and uh, I will make some of those recommendations to you because I think they're very excellent. And I particularly recommend that if you have any uh, uncertainty about the uh, whether you're getting the full benefits or not, um, if you're not feeling fantastic and, and blissful, then you may well benefit from um, having something underneath the um, the backside of the of the spine from the uh, from the from the sacrum up to the head, so that you are so that that is elevated and uh, by a few inches perhaps and the uh, pelvis will be anteriorly tilted in other words the the uh, iliac crests will will roll forward and um, so your 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 buttocks will still be if, if you're lying on the floor for example the buttocks and legs will still be on the floor um, but then the but then the there'll be a slight um tilt in the in the pelvis because the um because of that support under the back so that i think is an excellent recommendation and then you also would want to have something additional under the head to help keep the head coming tipping forward slightly and what I find that this does is it really helps to open up and expose the front side of the of the abdomen uh, and the chest, really the whole torso, front and back and side, left and right. But um, particularly noticeable for me is on the front side. And so you want to have the uh, the height of whatever this is that's under the back, which could be a folded blanket, it could be a yoga bolster, uh, could be a cushion, but it's the height of it and the firmness of it will um, be up to you. So it has to be something that's adequately comfortable for you. If it's too much, you will be uncomfortable. It'll be hard for you to relax. So you wanna be able to relax. Okay, but if you can do that to whatever degree, you will likely find that it's very helpful for this. So you're wanting to uh, really allow yourself to be supported. Okay, so that's one suggestion is that you can have something so that support under the back to help open up the front a little bit. Um, also, regardless of any of that, something under the back of the head can often help to um, tip the skull forward, and that will bring the head into this Jalandhara Bandha position. So uh, that's another one of those fancy sounding words, but it's one of these three great um, um bundas which are binds um or locks that are used in pranayama and um this jalandhara is the bringing the the chin toward the uh the chest and this this sort of divot just where the throat base of the throat meets the uh breastbone and then Simultaneously, you're bringing the breastbone, the sternum, up toward the chin so that you're bringing them together and they meet. Now, how do you bring the sternum up toward the chin? Well, it turns out that the, those, all those ribs that make up your chest, they connect to the spine in the back and, uh, and to the breastbone in the front. And all those ribs can do what's called articulation, which is like if you imagine a uh, handle on a bucket, 
that can just, it hinges. Similarly, your ribs can kind of hinge in that way so that they can move upward. And when they do, the sternum moves up toward the chin. So you can do that. Now, when you're doing that, you're gonna, so you don't wanna strain. This is, if you're straining, then that's counter to our, our what we're wanting to achieve here. So if you're, so you wanna find how you can do all of this without strain. And so you have to really be aware, you have to tune in. And you notice, where is the strain? Where do you feel those sensations, the discomfort? What, you know, what's happening there? Slow it all down. And you'll notice perhaps that there's some unnecessary tension in the throat. Maybe there's some unnecessary tension in the shoulder or the upper chest. Maybe there's some unnecessary tension in the abdomen. And that's usually, we'll find uh, a good amount of unnecessary tension in the abdomen. So to the best of your ability, you're going to maintain that Jalandhara Bandha throughout. But also understand that, that although the at a gross level, uh, the, the Bandha is manifest in this particular way, which the chin moves to the chest and the chest moves to the chin, that the Bandha itself is subtler, it's energetic. So you want to start to notice that when you when you're doing that, what is the subtler felt sense of like a a a, a bunda a, a a bind that that a lock that seals the energy so that the energy doesn't move up into the head because when we're moving the energy with this pranayama, which is what what it means prana is we, we can understand is energy and yama means um, control. So we're controlling the energy. When we're moving the energy with this particular uh, pranayama that we're gi giving instruction, this preliminary instruction on now, then um, it can be a somewhat large, relatively large movement. And um, we don't want that to move up into the head because if it moves up into the head, we start to feel pressure, discomfort, strain, and so we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So at a phys physical level, this m movement of the head and chest helps to, in, in, to produce or in, invoke that bandha, but we want to also notice at a subtler level so that you can start to let go more and more and more of all the unnecessary tension physically, but you can maintain the actual bandha at an energetic level. So I'm not saying that you should just like collapse the chest and punch forward and, uh, and all that. I'm saying still maintain the physical posture as best you can without strain. And if at any point you need to just let go completely so because you find that you're not knowing how to do it without strain, then just do. Just completely relax. But Keep when when possible, you come back to activating the bandha, and uh, to the best of your ability, don't do the following pranayama unless that bandha is in place. And if you're not sure, then you'll find out because you'll start to feel that unpleasantness of the pressure in moving up into the head, and then you'll just stop because you'll know that you're you're not you're you're doing it in a way that's not good. So the now the abdomen is where we're usually holding a tremendous amount of tension and there are many layers in which the tension is held. And so we um, we want to have some attention there. Now, when the chest is lifted toward the toward the head, toward the chin, 
then you'll notice that the distance between the pubic bone and the base of the, the, the bottom of the ribs is lengthened. So if you're holding tension in the abdomen and that's lengthened, what you'll notice is that you feel that tension more pronouncedly. You'll feel the strain there. You'll feel the sensation there, a pulling or straining or something of that sort. And uh, so that's a good sign to you that's helping you to become aware of that so that you can let it go. Now, one thing that you can do is you can, it's helpful is place your hands there on the abdomen so that you can have some of the fingers at the, along the base of the, the lower ribs. And then, then the fingers can spread out over the abdomen so that you kind of have a good sense, tactile sense of that entire abdomen. Remarkably, our hands, I think, usually kind of can just kind of fit nicely in that whole space if we spread the fingers gently. So you're feeling there with your fingers, just the hands resting there, not pushing, no ten unnecessary tension in the hands or arms. And just notice as you're inhaling and as you're exhaling that you can allow yourself to soften and relax in the abdomen more and more because you don't actually need to tense up the abdomen at all in order to just lie here and breathe. So if you're tensing up the abdomen at all, even the slightest, then you're exerting a tremendous amount of energy and um, in, a, in a, particularly in a way that's reinforcing what you don't want in your life, you see? Because when you hold that tension in the abdomen, it's constantly signaling to your nervous system that something's wrong, something's bad, there's a problem. So your brain is constantly working overtime trying to figure out what the problem is and how you're going to fix it. So this is a, a fairly simple but profoundly effective technique. And we're only in the preliminary stages. We haven't even actually gotten to the pranayama yet. But just this much is very powerful because it starts to shift you away from the density and the despair and, and, the, and the bad investment of energy to a subtler mode of perceiving that allows you to energetically, you know, very quickly start to let go of the layers of unnecessary effort that hold in place exactly what you don't want. So now you're aware of your breath because you're aware of the sensations of the breathing as you're also aware of what you're feeling in the abdomen while you're breathing. Okay, so now already it's a lot to be aware of. So remember, you've got to be gentle. It's very, very important. Don't make the mistake of thinking that if you just you know, slog through it and endure that there's going to be a prize for you because there won't. The prize comes from the, from the direct revelation and that direct revelation comes through, through, through sincerity and gentleness with yourself. So don't make the mistake of of, 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 of metaphorically or I guess metaphor metaphorically flogging yourself as a as a technique for success because it, it just doesn't work. So rest as needed. And as you are able to, you're gonna be aware of all of these things. You're gonna be aware of keeping the the chest, lifted in the sense that the ribs are articulating so that the the distance between the 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 ribs and the pubic bone is lengthened and as you're 
inhaling, you're letting the belly relax. And as you're exhaling, you're letting the belly relax. And because your fingers are placed there on the abdomen, you can sense where there's still some residual tension. So for example, you might not even really be able to clearly distinguish with your fingers wh what, where exactly the lower ribs are. You may not be able to clearly distinguish exactly where the pubic bone is. You may not even be able to clearly distinguish exactly where the iliac crests of the pelvis are, even though they're these big honking muscles, I mean bones. So now that's probably very normal. So don't freak out about it. But I do want you to know, or at least at least ask yourself, why is that? Is that is that good? Is that how it's supposed to be? I mean, should I really not be able to know precisely where my bones are? Should I be so afraid of these sensations, so guarded, so armored that I can't actually locate my bones by clearly by touch? You know, just notice, because here's the thing, if, if, it, if your bones, uh, what I have found is that when the, when the soft tissue is fully relaxed, the bones don't produce any unpleasant sensations. So if there's any kind of unpleasant sensation, mild or not so mild, like uh, tenderness, soreness, or just a general kind of like uh, apprehension to really touch um, in a, in a, how do I say this? In a firm way, because you fear that maybe it's so delicate of a structure that the slightest little poke or prod might break it all. All of that is, all of those are signs that what Hannah would call sensory motor amnesia, it's that you, you've, you've got a lot of tension held there and you don't have to. So right away, I want you to understand that you don't, there's nothing in this world that requires that you hold that tension. Nothing. Your body does not require it. Nature does not require it. Your relatives do not require it. Your work does not require it. Nothing could require it. There is no requirement for that. The only reason that you hold that tension is because you're ignorant of the fact that you're holding that tension. And instead, you imagine that it's all kinds of other things, like other people causing the problems or some dysfunction in the body or some you know, mal, uh, formation in the body or whatever the case may be. You have various stories about it, but actually it's sensory motor amnesia, which is good news because you can, you, you can remedy that. You have a technique here that's going to help you with this tremendously. So you're going to, it's very important utilize just for this technique. I'm not saying for all of your life, always, Although maybe it would be helpful, but I'm, I'm not making that claim right now. But definitely for the um, application of this technique that I'm sharing with you today, it is very important that you maintain to the best of your ability that distance between the uh, pubic bone and the ribs. So that because if that shortens, then you're going to lose a lot of your sensitivity and awareness of the of the this important region of the abdomen that we really need to allow to release okay so that's why to the best of your ability you want to maintain that that jalandara bandha without strain so don't think it has to be so exaggerated it's just to whatever degree is possible for you to do with with adequate comfort 
now. Okay, so we're always kind of straddling. We don't want to be so uncomfortable that it that we can't uh, really allow the experience. Neither do we want to be so, we'll put it in air quotes, comfortable that we fall asleep. We want to be right there in between so that we're fully awake and able to be adequately attentive in a in a clear good way to what is happening so as you're maintaining all of this which i know is a lot i'm going to suggest to you now some other things to be aware of so you're inhaling and you're exhaling and i want you to allow those inhales and exhales to start to be uh, regular and even and smooth so shouldn't be forced. It's not that you're trying to achieve the world's longest inhalation or the world's longest exhalation. It should be comfortable and also uh, not just haphazard or uh, what is uh, habitual, but it should be intentional so that you're allowing for it to be slow, smooth, even and uh, equal in terms of the duration of the inhalation and the exhalation. And at this point, we're not maintaining any pauses, um, at, at least not intentionally, or retentions between inhalation and exhalation. It's okay if it naturally arises, but right now we're wanting to, as best as we can, have our intention be that the inhalation and exhalation are of equal amount and they're um, complete and satisfying without introducing a, a retention between. Now, as you're inhaling, I want you to particularly notice what's happening with the ribs. So when you're in this position, the um, because you're doing this articulation of the ribs, so that the, the abdomen is lengthened. What this means is that when, as you're inhaling, what should be happening is that you're activating your thoracic diaphragm in order to bring in the air. So the thoracic diaphragm, I want you to visualize or sense, is this muscle or composite muscle that... Um, exists internally uh, between the thoracic cavity, which is the chest, the rib cage, and the abdo abdominal cavity. So it's when it's in its resting position, it's like a dome. I'm exaggerating it with my hands. It's not that pronounced, but it's a dome. Okay. And when you inhale, particularly in this position, you're activating that thoracic diaphragm, which contracts and lowers. So it kind of flattens out. Now, in this position, what that's going to do, because that thoracic diaphragm has attachments all around the base of the rib cage, the bottom of the rib cage. So what's going to happen is your ribs have to move. Because in order for in order to accommodate the movement of the thoracic diaphragm, which is contracting, the ribs are actually gonna to have to move. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna to have to move out to the sides primarily and further up. Now, don't think it has to be this huge movement because it doesn't, it could, it's probably gonna be a relatively small movement, but you want to start to tune into that. And then as you allow for the exhalation, you want to, as best you can, allow for the exhalation to be slow and controlled and to, to come to a, a true neutral resting position um, of, the, of the diaphragm and the abdomen so that you're not contracting anything unnecessarily. Because our tendency is actually to 
force the exhalation at least a little bit because we have the sensory motor amnesia that causes us to unconsciously keep maintain this, this spasm of the abdominal muscles. So we over exhale. So we're wanting to allow the exhalation to just come to a neutral position, a resting position of the thoracic diaphragm and the abdomen. So the abdomen remains relaxed and soft throughout, but the ribs are moving out to the sides and up a little bit with each inhalation, and then they're returning to a resting position with the exhalation. Okay, so now this is the basic pranayama. There's more, uh, much more. So I'm gonna not going to uh, do the guided practice too much longer, but we're going to take a few more minutes, and I'm going to walk you through a few other tips that will be helpful. So I know that's a lot to be aware of, but that's why it's a practice and it's a it's useful uh, to to practice. It's a good thing to practice. Like we're practicing all the time. It's just a question of what we're practicing, and oftentimes we're practicing things that are not helpful. You know, we're very practiced at uh, thought fixation, for example. Everybody's really good at that for the most part. You know, we're very practiced at worrying. We're very practiced at leaping to the wrong conclusions. We're very practiced at hostility. We're very practiced at victimization. We're very practiced at a lot of things that are not helpful to us. And then on some sort of idealistic grounds, oftentimes we'll, uh, we'll object to practicing anything useful, which I is really foolish because as I'm, I'm pointing out, we're always practicing. So it's just a question of what we're practicing. And if we're not practicing something consciously, we're practicing unconsciously. And if you're not liking what you're experiencing, guess what? You're practicing unhelpful things. So this is something that you can practice that's very helpful. I'm going to talk you through a few more pointers. And the more you practice, the easier it becomes. So I know at first it seems like, oh my goodness, it's so much and how could I ever do it? And it's hard and it's too much and all these things. So ease up because that's that's no way to succeed. Don't Don't make it hard on yourself. You know, like just see, how am I making this hard on myself? How can I ease up a little bit? How can I be true to the essence of this and 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 still be gentle with myself, to really be kind to myself and good to myself? So, um, but also know that as you continue to practice, it, that becomes second nature and then you can start to be aware of more at, all at once. So for those, and some of you who are here live, I know you'll, you have the capacity this time that you can be aware of more. So I'll, I'll point out some other things. One is notice the tongue. So this is actually a really uh, very useful thing. So notice the tongue because oftentimes we have a tendency to start pressing the tongue up against the roof of the mouth. And in some types of pranayamas and in some, you know, qigong, it's recommended to tip to put the the tongue in various positions, some of which involve touching the roof of the mouth. But um, for our purpose here, we want to allow the tongue to relax in the in the lower jaw. Because when we press the tongue against the roof of the mouth, it produces a particular experience. I'm not saying that experience is good or bad. It's just that it's a particular experience. And that might seem like obvious, but yes, uh, I mean, everything that we do produces that experience. But the thing is, we want flexibility so that we're not locked in to one experience, particularly if maybe that one experience is not the most useful for us. So allow the tongue to relax in the, in the uh, lower jaw. So you're breathing in this way. You're allowing 
the tongue to relax in the lower jaw. And really allow it to relax. So notice how deeply can you let the tongue relax. Also notice the eyes. So <clears throat> you, I didn't give instructions about whether to keep the eyes open or closed. It's up to you, but either way, you might notice that for many people, at least, the tendency will be for the eyes to start to move up, particularly on the inhalation. We oftentimes have a have patterned uh, eye movement along with the breath, particularly when we're breathing consciously. So we want to allow the eyes to also relax and move downward. So you could in, you could close the eyes and you can imagine that you're looking within yourself internally, like. Don't strain the eyes trying to actually draw them down into the skull or anything, but just imagine as if you're able to look interiorly in down into the torso. So letting the eyes be relaxed, but with that intention that you're looking down into the interior of your torso. So the tongue is relaxed in the in the lower jaw, the eyes are relaxed, looking down as if into the torso. And you're allowing for the, the ribs to articulate so that the abdomen is lengthened. The abdomen is soft, remaining relaxed and relaxing more deeply with every inhalation and every exhalation. The ribs are slightly moving out to the sides and up with each inhalation and then returning to a neutral, resting, relaxed position with the exhalation. The inhalations and exhalations are through, oh, I didn't mention this, through the nose. That's an important point. And uh, relaxed, gentle, so that you can start to feel the the air traveling through the nostrils in, with increasing sensitivity. So now, a couple more things, and then we'll wrap it up. Be aware of the uh, breath as it fills the lungs. So we're allowing to, to ourselves to start to become sensitive to the inner sensations of the lungs, of the respiratory system. So you can start to feel the air moving through the nostrils, moving down the throat, down into the bronchioles and into the lungs. And you want to start to notice that you can allow for it to be even on both sides. So allow for the air to move through the nostrils evenly and equally so that both right and left, it, the equal amounts of air, equal speed, equal ease, equal comfort, moving through the right nostril and the left nostril and that the, each of the lungs are filling and emptying equally in a balanced way. So Iyengar suggests that for some people, many people commonly, it, it, it may be helpful to give particular attention to allowing for the uh, lower portion of the right lung to expand because for many people, he suggests, and I can't confirm or deny this because I don't have enough uh, of a sample size to be able to determine it, but he claims um, that the liver um, produces more resistance to the expansion of the lower portion of the right lung versus the left. Now, the, the left lung also has some differences from the right lung because the left lung is actually 
usually slightly smaller than the right lung and because the heart is slightly to the left side. But you can start to sense inwardly, just, you know, be open to it and start to explore this because, of course, at first, you're not going to have mastery over it. So I'm, nobody's expecting, other than maybe you, that you should have mastery over it at first. It's a something that you can gain mastery over you through sincere practice. And I'm proposing that it's worthwhile because this is going to function on many levels to help you. You know, it shifts your attention away from the, the, the unhelpful patterns. It helps to uh, calm the nervous system, bring balance to the nervous system, helps you to open to new, more helpful perspectives, helps you to regulate the entire uh, physical body so that you start to experience greater ease at physical levels, mental levels, and energetic levels. So that's the aim here. So um, for today, that's our complete guided practice. And so for those who are here live, uh, we will proceed momentarily to the uh, Q&A. For everybody who doesn't have access to the Q&A, um, I'd want to just give a few uh, notes about how to proceed. Um, well, and this is for everybody, really, is I do recommend that you do this as a daily practice. And I recommend generally, although we didn't do it um, today, and it was primarily because I talked too much, uh, but uh, normally I would recommend that following your practice of the formal pranayama, um, that you simply relax deeply and allow yourself as best as is possible for you to simply rest in that higher uh, state of consciousness um, because that will be very helpful to you. And so in that higher state of consciousness, um, this is where you can really start to, in a sense, absorb the bliss. It's just a way of saying it. But you start to notice that here you've, you've you know, your attention was on the, was on the technique for the duration of the practice. And then that, but that was really shifting you. It, the technique itself isn't, is, is not as important as what the technique is leading you to. And so if you just, it's like you're thirsty, you go to the water, but then you don't drink the water. So you want to drink the water. you you know, you've gone to the water, now drink the water. So you want to receive the benefits of the practice. So I would recommend that you just relax deeply and just remain awake, but not, not grasping at anything, not attaching to anything, and just simply openly receiving the self. Uh, and you should find that that's very deeply nourishing and it can off, it can, it can uh, um, remedy um, a, a lot of problems because when you're when you allow yourself to to be present at this level, so much of the you know that parabda karma is um, it, it, it is is uh, actually completed. It's it doesn't it doesn't lead to any other karma because it's allowed to resolve in the light of consciousness. See, as if you if it otherwise was allowed, which habitually it does, it moves into these grosser levels of experience, then we're reacting to it. 
And when we're reacting to it, then there's there, there you go. There's the karma. <laughs> now now you've got more parabdha karma, and on it goes. But when you rest here, simply uh, soaking in this silence, if to to whatever degree you know you can uh, recognize it, but really just allow yourself to rest deeply. And and but not to fall asleep, just to be really present to the deep surrender, the deep peace that you can find here. Um, just know that it's very, very powerful because all of this stuff is the, you know, that parabda karma is still being activated. But now instead of that energy moving and creating more karma, just you know, moving on to the next form of it, it is actually uh, revealed and 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 absorbed in the light of consciousness. So, in, in in other in other words, instead of it being something that perpetuates more suffering, it's deeply healing and nourishing. So it's really important. Um, and I recommend that you do this at least once a day. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it and I had been recommending um, not more than twice a day. Um, but I, I want to slightly modify that. So um, I recommend at least once a day. I really suggest at least once a day, five to 10 minutes. You could do less if for some reason you think you need to do less or whatever. Um, but in general, five to 10 minutes would be a good amount. Um, and then take one to two minutes to just rest deeply and, and soak in that bliss. So, and you know, you'll start to see that that's up to you. The bliss is always here. It's just up to you to really allow it, to soak in it, to recognize it. Because normally what happens is those things, those, you know, the parabda karma bubbles up and we're off, you know, we're grabbed onto the next bumper and off we go. But when we choose, we can allow ourselves this like, there it is, and we can just rest. And it, there another one, and we just rest. And you can start to find that there's, that's the enlivening of the bliss. Rather than that being a problem, it's like, wow, this is wonderful. All that stuff that I thought was so problematic at this more subtle level, it's just, the, it's the, it's activating the bliss. So it can be a really wonderful experience. And I would recommend it, um, that you do that at least once a day. And then you soak in that for one to two minutes. Now, um, in general, um, more the, the more you can soak in that bliss, the better. But on the other hand, there's sometimes it can be a little bit destabilizing, um, and so you need to it, it, not not destabilizing. I don't. I'm talking too much, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. But just know it could be a little bit destabilizing, so I don't recommend that you do it too much. Um, but as you become more familiar with it, uh, you can start to experiment with um, utilizing it more frequently. And uh, so start with once a day, if it's if you're just starting five to 10 minutes um, of the, of the uh, Ujjayi Pranayama, and then do um, one to two minutes of soaking in the bliss, okay? And then, if once you're comfortable with that, if you'd like to do it twice a day, you could do it twice a day. Now, if you if you've been doing it twice a day and you're pretty comfortable and stable, feel stable with that, then I would recommend that you can start to. Um, it, uh, I would recommend that you, you start to um, see how you can implement it a little um, in a uh, practical way throughout your day. So, for example, you might notice that there are certain times of day in which you start to feel agitated or grumpy or irritable or fatigued or whatever may be the case. 
Well, that would be a great time of day for you to take five to 10 minutes and do this because otherwise, you know, what's going to happen is you're likely to start practicing something unhelpful. But here's something you could practice that could be helpful. And so as you become really comfortable and familiar with it, then you'll start to find that you can really apply it um, more frequently and more efficiently so that you can really start to more readily and rapidly arrive just at the soaking in the bliss so that it doesn't have to be necessarily five to 10 minutes of the pranayama. And then you'll find that you can start to actually function more at while, while you're soaking in the bliss. So that starts to translate into more of your day so that it's not like I have to go into this special room in the silence and put on my headphones in the dark and, you know, lie down on the floor and do the whole thing and, you know, get all my props and everything. Like, that's all great when you need it. Um, I, 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 I do recommend that as a starting point. But as you become more familiar and comfortable with it, then start to see that you can um, you can start to access that and integrate that into your life because that's really again that's the goal. It's not that you just are doing the breathing practice all the time because that's not really what's true for you. That's not your purpose in this life. Um, but it can it's a it's an important and helpful technique that will help you to fulfill your purpose. So you want to use it in, in an intelligent way. I hope that's all clear. That's a lot of talking, way more than I was anticipating. But now uh, we'll wrap that up. And I'll just say also one more thing for people in, on YouTube. Um, don't don't uh, harm yourself. So and this is true for everybody, not just the people on YouTube, but especially the people on YouTube um, who otherwise might make the mistake more readily don't harm yourself and 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 do something that's not working because you have a misunderstanding or don't um make it hard on yourself unnecessarily i i've i've done that i can assure you like i said i was no no exaggeration tens of thousands of hours of practice practice most of it of of the wrong thing um and so why, why do that? You don't need to do that. Um, so if you have doubts, questions, concerns, if something you know, is not seeming to get the hang of something or something's not working for you or whatever, um, please ask for support. I, I want to offer that to you because I, I want you to receive the benefits of this. I know that you can have a better life. I know that you can fulfill your purpose. I know that's why you're here. And um, and so you, you can, this can support you in that. That's the purpose of it. But you have to put it into practice in the right way, which means you have to be gentle, sensitive, loving, kind. If you're just like doing it as a mechanical thing, you'll hurt yourself. So you really need to slow down and be gentle and kind and patient and I have, to, I have to promise it. It will be the last thing I'm going to say, and um, and and be um, have positive expectation, knowing that there's something truthful here that can point you in a good way, that can lead you to rest more deeply in yourself, to know the bliss of the of the self, and um, that can transform in a positive way, all the levels of, of, of your experience. So um, be gentle on the one hand, but also know that this doesn't have to be take lifetimes and lifetimes. You can get very good results very quickly when you apply it in the correct way. So know that too. And if you're not getting the good results, then just know that it probably needs some correction. So ask for some help. Okay. That's enough with that. Okay.